button. So, um, got a lot going here on my screen, so just got to rearrange a few things just so that I can get to um, the the scenes. Uh, I'm a cheater. I don't really like you know when the the, the Zoom sh screen share goes all all wacky. So um, you you know I I love to kind of do in sh in screen shares using this software that I have eCam. <laughs> so so you may want to spotlight me you know otherwise the the things might appear very small. Um, but you know, um, th thank you all for having me today. Uh, my name is Mike Strode. I'm out of Chicago. Uh, specifically, if you are familiar with Chicago, I'm in Southeast Chicago uh, in a space called South Deering um, and the micro neighborhood of Jeffrey Manor. Um, but you know, um, I I've been here for 20 years, and um, in the course of that 20 years, I've, I've been involved in a, a variety of different activities. You know, mostly some things I kind of stumbled into by accident. Uh, I was on the parent council of my uh, uh, daughter's school um, called Betty Shabazz International Charter um, School. And during the course of being on the parent council, we had a project called the Healthy Food Hub that came and approached the parent council and said, hey, we want to set up you know, a food hub within the school. Um, would you all like to support us in this process? You know, In the course of that, 30 families came together, began building out a buying club, food hub, reverse CSA uh, uh, program in that school. And in the course of that, that's really what activated me in a lot of the um, current organizing that I, I was doing. Before that, I had done you know, some other interfaith organi organizing um, in uh, Inglewood neighborhood here. Um, but you know, I, I, some, I sometimes put a, a, a barrier between those two forms of organizing, but in truth, they were both trying to accomplish some of the similar aspirations and some similar aims uh, as I work towards in the solidarity economy now. Um, and I also want to, you know, as we do in our SE 101, acknowledge myself as being on the territory of the Council of Free Fires, um, the, the Ojibwe and, and um, the Pot, um, Ottawa. Uh, Menominee and many other tribes and, and, and peoples, you know, who have uh, uh, stewarded this land historically, uh, and they now call it Chicago. Um, and so, you know, acknowledging and honoring that because that too is part of this this notion of the solidarity economy that um, I ground my work in. Um, the current work, the current project that's really taking up most of my time and most of my life is um, the Cola Nut Collaborative. Uh, so, you know, in, in describing it very simply, I always talk about it just being a Chicago-based, a Chicago um, area time-based service and skills exchange, otherwise known as a time bank. I've tried leading with time bank and then folks are like, what's a time bank? <laughs> so, you know, I try to put that little definition in before I say time bank. Um, but effectively, uh, the, the work that I do now is really just trying to connect with uh, community partners, community organizations, uh, movement building and social justice spaces um, to really talk about skill and resource exchange um, and, and just, you know, in a way that does not involve money. So, you know, basically using time as a type of currency that allows us to share our skills, um, express our needs, uh, and, and exchange those sorts of things in a, in a process that, um, that hopefully binds us together, um, binds us together in networks of reciprocal exchange. Um, so, so that project started in 2017, and it was born out of the work that I was doing, as I mentioned earlier, with the Healthy Food Hub and uh, Betty Chavez. Um, and effectively, we were trying in the Healthy Food Hub to, to figure out how to sustain a distribution hub. Um, so the, the secret for those who are not involved and engaged in food, um, and no secret for those who are engaged in food, um, they are not, there's not a lot of margin in trying to sell food directly. Um, if you are doing it, you're probably going to be doing it for a very uh, a social good purpose and not because you'll, you'll earn a lot of profit. But um, there was great value in what we were doing in terms of the, developing the Healthy Food Hub. There was great social energy that happened in the process of, you know, of offering these market days and offering a way for people to pre-order and really had make democratic decisions in terms of their food. So we wanted to make sure that this um, Healthy Food Hub model uh, was still available. But the distribution hubs were becoming increasingly um, you know, labor intensive, uh, and it was really a challenge to sustain those distribution hubs. And there were also communities who wanted to open up new hubs that we just did not have the capacity to do. So the, the time bank was brought in in an attempt to try to use that as a way to incentivize communities to run their own distribution hubs. 
Um, and, and, you know, and, and then hopefully if they can run the distribution hubs, all we would have to do is, you know, work with the producers and do ag aggregation of the produce um, and then get it to the site where they were going to run the distribution. So that was a try, you know, in terms of using the time bank for that purpose did not really pan out to be, you know, very useful for that purpose. I think it still has applications. It's just, you know, we couldn't fit it in that project because we were simultaneously would have to launch the time bank help people understand the time bank and still run the distribution hubs and, and train out on new hubs. So all, all of those pieces moving at once didn't really you know, work as, as, as a model for how to, how to build the time bank there. But um, in working on that, that initiative, it was, um, I, I certainly saw that there was broad application for in, engaging the time bank in other movement building and other um, um, organizations. Um, that that were you know elsewhere that also also um, you know were kind of having these social good projects that maybe did not generate a lot of financial capital but you had a lot of a lot of social capital and a lot of other forms of capital that were available there. Um, so I just want to take a glance you know uh, now. Uh, so what you see behind me, uh, this is you know the vision of what you know what was the healthy food hub and what uh, the time bank grew out of. Um, in the, the above my head, you see a photo of, uh, of us kind of doing a yarn activity, which is just one of the ways we kind of make time banking um, a living practice. Um, you see me in a field um, doing a blueberry um, picking exercise. So, you know, the community members came out to Rehoboth, a blueberry patch um, near Pembroke Township, uh, which is, uh, you know, near Kankakee here in Chicago. And what I basically I had learned, you know, the week before the best, the, the, the art of picking blueberries. And I was able to take that skill, share it with members of the community, and then, you know, uh, invite them into that process of harvesting, doing the you pick blueberries. Um, and then below, you know, to, to, you know, to on the other side of me, you see a member of uh, the Healthy Food Hub who is running the dry goods station. So another way that we implemented before the time banking was in place, um, we implemented a way of sort of resource exchange was that members came into the Healthy Food Hub and they might earn a food salary, you know, just a sort of credit for the market, um, basically for working one of the stations. So, you know, that was sort of one of the early pilots and one of the early models of how we use time banking within the, the Healthy Food Hub itself. Uh, so, you know, and, and, and I, I like to kind of call the, the, the two parents of the, the Colonet Collaborative, um, the two logos that you see here, the Healthy Food Hub and Calorie Collective. Uh, Calorie Collective com comes out of St. Louis, um, and that time bank was established um, way back, at, I want to say in 2007, um, was when Shinyere Ote established that time bank. Um, you know, really established it for a very basic reason, um, was, a, was a new mother and was really looking to not ramp up in work. And so was trying to figure out how to develop um, a process for fulfilling the needs that, that, uh, that she had in, in terms of her life while also you know, not, not needing to do that by going and, and being sort of working for dollars or for someone else. So the time bank was a way that um, she could gather together the folks that were around her, um, engage in this process of thinking about how they could share skills together. And then the time bank was something that really naturally and gradually grew out of that. And when I, when I first encountered that story, while I was still working with the Healthy Food Hub, I was very attracted to that model of time banking. It didn't it didn't mirror what I had heard of time banking or what I'd seen of time banking. Um, and, you know, what I'd seen of time banking was really that it was mostly altruistic. It wasn't really trying to challenge, you know, the dominant economic frameworks. It didn't seem to have a, have a view on, you know, the fact that capitalism is extractive and, you know, and someone who, who has a child should not necessarily be pinned against the wall of kind of meeting needs and, and you know, also uh, addressing the needs of those children. Um, so, you know, I really, I was really attracted to both the story of Calorie Collective, but also to its model of organizing thin community. And that was something that I wanted to see in Chicago. Um, at the time, we did have a, a, um, a time bank in Chicago, and I'll just click away from this for a brief moment. Um, we did have a time bank in Chicago um, called Chicago Time Exchange, but it was also confined to the artist communities. And so, you know, um, I, I, I thought that there was there, there was a missed opportunity there, right? There's an opportunity that folks who are rallying and organizing for economic justice, for social justice, um, also have a view that we can be uh, engaged in skill sharing, but the time bank wasn't connected in the, to those spaces and in those ways. 
And so the Colonet Collaborative really came out in initially expressly to connect with social justice, connect with community organizing, connect with movement building uh, partners, and really bring time banking up, uh, outside of this framework um, of, of just being a sort of volunteer, voluntary or altruistic or neighborly thing. Um, no, we think that there is a, a, a practice of economic justice um, you know, that, that we can engage in that it that is time banking. And so we, we really talk about time banking in that way as being a, a, a real challenge to, um, to, in, to economic injustice. Um, so the, the other thing that I, I want to kind of um, dig into is uh, this, this sort of visual, right? You know, this is sort of, a, that was the Cola Nut Pass, you know, the Healthy Food Hub, um, the Cola Nut Present. And I'll have to kind of move this logo so that you can see all of that. Um, so the, the present state of the Cola Nut, um, the Cola Nut Collaborative right now uh, functions, as I mentioned, as a bridge. Um, and, you know, a lot, of, a, a lot of that bridge, you know, just sort of full, full and transparent is just me kind of talking and me kind of being engaged with, with people and practices that I, I am interested in. Um, and, but, you know, the Cola Nut Collaborative functions as a way that, that some of those things can connect with each other and that overlaps in their work can, can be seen. So um, one of the earliest projects that um, we launched in Chicago in, in partnership. So, um, so originally when we launched the Cola Nut, um, you know, I, I, I took a trip over to the DSA. They had a solidarity economy working group going and I was really just interest, interested in pitching. Hey, you know, you all are a solidarity economy working group. Um, I've got this thing called time banking that, you know, I'm trying to work on, you know, building up. Um, is there a way that your work can engage um, with the time bank. And, you know, um, unbeknownst to me, basically, I would inherit the group because the, um, the, the chair of that group would, would shift off to Milwaukee very shortly after. So I inherited the, the Solidarity Economy Working Group um, and just kind of ended up uh, working to kind of foment and build um, Solidarity Economy within the DSA, which required me to learn about a lot about Solidarity Economy. I hadn't known about it. I was coming in to do time banking, and that was really my narrow focus. But once you begin to, to think about, help people think about time banking, you realize that time banking doesn't make sense as a standalone practice. It's really only when you connect it to the broad pantheon of different things, to cooperatives, to participatory budgeting, uh, to people's assemblies, um, to all of these other, diff other practices that exist within the solidarity economy. Um, that's when time banking begins to make the most sense. And that's when you can have the most impact um, so, you know, engaged with the Solidarity Economy Working Group, um, we ended up launching um, something called the Solidarity, well, a, a previous iteration of a Solidarity Economy 101, um, you know, which really was just us bringing in four presenters. Uh, we had a presenter from the Dill Pickle Food Co-op, uh, a presenter from the Highland, um, from a community land trust, and um, a present uh, myself from the time bank and then we had one other presenter from i am i am going to forget the fourth presenter at the moment um so we did that solidarity economy 101 we had those those presentations brought people in we said hey the solidarity economy is you know what socialism looks like in practice right you know so we should be engaged as dsa with the solidarity economy um we that 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 event you know attracted about 40 people um, we, we were like, hey, that was great. It was a great event. Let's do the next thing. We were planning the next thing. And suddenly, you know, two months down the road, someone announced we should have a cooperative economy summit. Um, and, you know, it was only like two months away when they wanted to host it. Um, someone pre-announced it earlier than they should have. But, you know, um, as those things get out, the summit ended up attracting about 200 people, um, you know, far more than we anticipated, you know, far more than we kind of, you know, after a 40 person event, you don't think that the, the next thing is going to be 200. So we host that uh, cooperative economy summit. Um, it, it would officially, it was officially the first, you know, the previous iterations we had here were worker co-op summits, um, we, but we'd never had anything that was really focused on all of the areas of cooperation coming, coming together. So we had housing co-ops present, food co-ops, um, we had some worker co-op presentations at the time with our Cook County, um, you know, that where they were pro, uh, promoting some, some some things to the commission um, about procurement from from worker cooperatives, uh, and you know, it was it was a real 
really big launch because it was um it, it preceded the Illinois legislation that we ended up uh, putting in force um the the following year, which was really to actually put legislation on the books that created a law that you know cemented worker cooperatives as an entity you could incorporate as. So um, really big deal for the the cooperative economy summit. You know um, that was a really great opportunity for those 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 uh, different cooperative spaces to get together. Um, and it actually led to, to some other things, you know, um, so it, it, it led to some of the connections with the US Solidarity Economy Network now. Um, the networks, the New Economy Coalition, we were already a member of that organization uh, at the time. Uh, so, you know, that, that was already in place, um, but it's now led to a few other different things, you know, so Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working, work, uh, study and working Group. Um, what what that, that space does is that we actually develop culturally um, affirming culturally relevant um, curriculum related to worker cooperatives for Black communities. So we started with uh, Dr. Jessica Gordon Nimhart's Collective Courage. Um, we began, you know, reading that text. We expanded and, and read other texts, but we've really just been trying to build a, 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 a study of worker cooperatives that is rooted in cultural experience and cultural practices. You know, I consider myself a cultural organizer, and I think culture is really, really important in terms of how organizing gets done. Um, and, and so, you know, that that's that was it was a really significant space to kind of practice that. Um, one of the the so that's that's Co-op for Lib. Um, we've now got the Chicago Mutual Housing Network, uh, inspired by the um, the Bay Area. Um, PACA, no, not PACA, no, it's, uh, in any case, Bay, Bay Area has, has a, 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 an association of people of color, um, cooperative housing network, right? Um, and so that auction, auction, there we go, uh, people of color sustainable housing network, inspired by that network, um, wanted to see that, you know, a, a mutual housing network existed in Chicago, which could be a space where the different cooperative housing spaces, cooperative houses could share their information, share you know that they had openings talk about their challenges um and chicago mutual housing network actually was a, a real network that existed here um it, it faded around like 2005 to 2007 um basically due to foundation funding drying up which is a really sorry way for you know something so important to go um but you know just kind of reviving the name has you know reinvigorated a little bit of energy it allowed uh, the coluna to come in and participate in a cooperative town hall that our one of our big lenders, Chicago Community Loan Fund, does each year. And so, you know, um, so so the Chicago Mutual Housing Network is is kind of trying to kind of you know um, give some energy to the the cooperative housing space, uh, the land trust space, all anything that collectivizes land, decommodifies land. Uh, we want to participate in that process. Um, and then the the final two sort of visuals that we see here are the Just Chicago which is um, a Woods Fund initiative, you know, where basically they wanted to do movement building. Uh, they wanted to fund a movement building initiative, right? Um, all of the grant makers this year, you know, are, are switching their criteria. They're like, hey, you know, we don't know what we're doing. Um, we've probably been funding the wrong thing. Tell us how to move. Um, so, you know, the, the movement building fund um, that Woods Fund has done is really about, a, a, about 12 uh, community partners really coming together and doing something that's beyond a coalition. So what does it look like when you actually begin to do relationship building instead of just like, you know, doing the coalition building where it's one delegate that goes there and they kind of, you know, hang around and they say, well, what do you need us to do? You know, but how do you actually get people in a room, build, build consistent, deep relationships and then build projects together? So that's something that's happening on the local level. And, and interestingly enough, it mirrors something happening with the US Solidarity Economy Network Called the Resist and Build Summit, which is trying to do some of the same type of work um, at, a, at a national level with um, organizations that are translocal, as they say. Um, so that that's that's uh, that's one piece of work. And then sort of the final thing that I'll highlight is um, the Movement Monday, um, the Ujama Hour, um, which is just really you know I, I'll, I'll note my pet project, you know, which is where I have conversations about the Black social and solidarity economy uh, once a month on a on a live broadcast really you know meant to kind of bring out of the shadows these are conversations that i've been having having at conferences and having you know on the side um and i wanted to have those conversations in public 
um, inspired, you know, um, by all of the, the the great talkers, the studs circles, and you know, and and and, and things like that. So, um, and, and on being, I'm a, I'm a great on being listener. Um, so, you know, I wanted to have those conversations in public, and the Movement Monday Ujima Hour was a way to do that and to have those um, conversations be visible to other people. Um, so that's the constellation of different things that the Colonel Collaborative is engaged in and doing now. Um, what's not listed here is the Offers and Needs Market Facilitator Network, um, which is the, the latest um, uh, project from the Colonut, which is uh, the Offers and Needs Market practice is something that I, I picked up from um, the Post Growth Institute. Um, so post, post growth, you know, is it's true to its name. It's about, you know, what is beyond growth? What is beyond, you know, capitalism? Um, uh, Donnie and uh, Donnie McClurkin and Crystal Arnold um, are, you know, some of the leads there. But the offers and needs market is really a facilitated uh, framework where you get people in a room, you start to unpack, you know, you help them unpack what are the things that they have to offer to one another, and you, you do a conversation round on that, you follow that with the needs round, and then hopefully at the end, what you've done is you've done some social matchmaking between the things that are offered and the things that are needed. Um, and what I what I found, you know, since 2019 is when I've been using the process. What I found is that you can't just drop. Well, no, in fact, you, you know, every organizer might know this, you know, better than I did when I launched the time bank. But you can't just drop some like technical process in and be like, hey, this is such a great tool. If I if I just tell people how great a tool it is, it's going to be used. That's not how it works, and certainly not with time banking. And so I have found, as many other time banking practitioners have found that a lot of time banks just wither away because you know people introduce a tool and they're like it's going to take off on its own and it doesn't um you know there are years and years of sort of advertising that that have gotten us to use the things that we use and certainly if we're trying to do a culture and behavioral shift activity we're going to need to actually work on doing some of that cultural organizing that i talked about earlier so the offers and needs market facilitation framework is a way to facilitate people in a conversation about what they need, or what they have to offer and what they need, and do it in a way that recognizes that expressing your needs is vulnerable. And so maybe you wanna get people in a space where they feel like I've got a lot of abundance that I'm pushing off and it's okay in this space for me to ask for something back, right? Um, so, you know, that that's that's the newest initiative. And what, what we're doing is I, I've learned the framework and I wanna make sure that there are organizers around Chicago that have the, have the facilitation and can do it in their own organizations or their own communities. So I've, I've uh, you know, um, sought out, you know, uh, some funding to support that. I'm gonna be connecting with, uh, with the Post Growth Institute and we're working with uh, a group of organizers in Scotland. And we're gonna actually train, you know, a cohort of about 20 people in that process so that in Chicago, we can see that practice among organizations here locally. Um, so, you know, uh, really, really excited to see what comes of that effort and, you know, and, and really looking forward to that. And, um, you know, this sort of last image is just kind of, you know, uh, uh, just my sort of visual, uh, just, just my closing thought of, of what I think about as the COLA future. So for those who are not familiar with the COLA nut, um, you know, as, a, as an edible item, um, in West African cultures, you know, and, and certainly and specifically, you know, uh, among uh, Ifa, you know, Ifa cultures and things like that, and Igbo cultures, um, the kola nut is traded as a, as a currency, right? It's it's traded as a currency that that has both social value, it has cultural value, um, and it, it's a physical nourishment, right? You can extract caffeine from it. You know, it's the root of cola. You know, the sort of you know cola and Coca Cola, um, and so. This, this currency, when you exchange it, um, what you're saying to that person, right, is you're saying, I want to have beneficial trading relationships with you. I want to welcome you into a, 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 a partnership, a relationship with, with me. Um, you are exchanging it at, you know, during marriage vows, you are exchanging it when you welcome someone into your household. So the cola nut is this thing that, you know, you, you, you exchange with someone that you want to remain connected with. Um, and so that that's sort of the symbol of the cola nut and and you know for me um it's i want more currencies like that i want more currencies that lock me in to a relationship with the people around me and you know don't encourage me to just see that hey i've given you five dollars and i've worked so hard for that five dollars you know why can't you be grateful for the fact that i put five bucks in your hand and you know just do the thing i asked you to do no we're in relationship i care about your well-being and so therefore, I want more currencies that encourage us to think that way. 
And the sort of other visual that you see there is this sort of this social infrastructure that uh, Nicholas Christakis, you know, does a lot of research on. And it really talks about how all sorts of health indicators travel along social networks. And so, you know, when you when you start to think about, you know, health indicators, when you start to think about well-being indicators, when you start to think about all of the things that impact our lives in a broad sense, um, social infrastructure is the thing that either ensures that we will get better together or we will, we will grow worse together. And so if we want to improve the, the ways that people are able to express well-being in their lives, we should try to improve the social infrastructure that is, is around them, you know, that, that binds, them, binds people together, builds cohesion, builds relationship, and, you know, helps us towards that new, uh, that, that new solidarity economy that, you know, we, we want to see uh, thrive in, in, in the world. Um, and I think I'll, I'll pause there. Thank you so much, Mike. It's it's amazing to see how much you've done, um, and the like the 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 networks and the infrastructures that are are so vital to 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 making all this work happen. So, does anybody have any questions? Um, I know we have a small group of people, but um, just want to kind of open it up for Q and A, um, and just to just to evolve a conversation. So I should uh, I should apologize. I want to apologize for for coming in late, and I apologize for having my uh, my beautiful tall grass and weeds uh, picture up instead of having my video up. I was just working on speaking of solidarity, uh, editing down some hearings, Senate Senate Judiciary Committee hearings from uh, a couple of decades ago on uh, union busting. Uh, so. These ideas are kind of fresh in my mind, but that's why I'm a little late. I did get to hear, however, your discussion of uh, time banks. And uh, I wonder if you are familiar with an initiative in Illinois uh, supported at the state level to, 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 take a, to take a slightly different approach. So time banks are in the category of a complementary currency or an alternative currency. And I, the description that you gave of the difficulties involved in, in pulling something like that together are, uh, are common. They're, they're well known with, among the thousands of community currencies that, 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 of, of, that have sprung up uh, over, over, over time and, uh, and through history. Uh, in Illinois, there's, an another, there's another approach that involves the taxing authorities. And there's a proposal kicking around to do a complementary currency, not a time bank, but one that um, is not the national currency of the United States. So that would be uh, a currency where you would have an issuer like the organizations you're talking about and except that it would be receivable in payment of state or municipal taxes, fees, or fines, which would give it the stability that complementary currencies historically uh, don't have. They tend to be related to people's passion for the project. And um, in other countries and in other contexts, we've seen that uh, these uh, tax receivable forms of complementary currencies are somewhat more robust. I don't know what your thoughts are there, if it's mixing too much with the power of the state, uh, reflections on various aspects, what do you think? Uh, gonna go to my facilitation hat and you know, do the yes and, um, <laughs> which you know, really is that um, I, here, here's where, you know, um, I end up blurring the lines a little bit. Um, so when I said that they are like, you know, there's time banks over here and there's like other sort of movement building economic justice initiatives over here. Um, what I often find, where I often find that I'm sitting in the middle is that um, I turn to, you know, folks like I'm, I'm in the Community Currency Alliance, you know, which is like a telegram chat, you know, where a bunch of people who are really passionate about community currencies talk about all of the different projects and pilots and prototypes they're developing. And, 
you know, maybe none of them ever sort of whispers about the sort of social justice implications, or maybe, you know, some of them are really enmeshed in it. Um, and then I turn to like, you know, the, the folks who are in movement building spaces, you know, um, or, or sort of movement front lines. And they're like, you know, um, I don't want to turn around. I don't want to mess around with technical fixes, you know, to the system. Like, I mean, I, I want to, I want to change it all. Right. Um, and so, I, and so when I say yes, and um, I think that it's, it's, it's a good thing to move toward, to look how, how, how we can move toward the sort of other complementary currencies that um, can diversify the types of ways people are able to exchange. Um, I don't think that necessarily this is in conflict with or, or, should, or what, the, what the time bank does should depend on that. Um, in my ideal world, there's a diversity of multiple different types of currencies and different types of ways that people exchange and in the, the sort of work that I grow from, so in the Healthy Food Hub, um, we, we were already sort of messing around with different ways of exchange, right? You know, we had like, uh, as I mentioned, a food salary and you could pay in dollars. And, you know, folks might come in there with, you know, SNAP benefits or something like that. And folks, you know, might have all sorts of other ways that they might be exchanging because our, our greatest desire was to address human need. And if we could, if we could facilitate some other way of addressing human need, that that you know didn't necessarily need to be in one of these other media forms of mediation we would do that um so you know i i, I would say to that you know i, I would just definitely reiterate like it, it's a sort of yes and conversation i don't actually see time banking as like a an actual it's not a solution um it's it's a practice that helps to get people thinking in a different way and for me it's a cultural organizing tool um in my tool belt and when it ceases to be a useful tool, I'll get rid of it. Like at some point, you know, it, I, I often talk about the way that the Cowrie Collective withered, right? So the Cowrie Collective was in existence for 10 years. And then at some point, you know, not, I mean, it, um, at some point, um, Kenya Ray is like, I'm, I'm through with this. I don't want to like organize this project anymore. I don't want to be involved in this anymore. And so that energy withdrawn from the time bank causes the time bank to wither. But the relationships and the connections that resulted from that 10 years of organizing remain like, you know, that's the point. Like the point is, do we still have those relationships at the end of the day? And can we do other things and, and build other organizing on top of those relationships? Um, and, you know, the time bank, I mean, hey, if it lives, it lives, you know, um, I'm not going to say the other movie quote, you know, <laughs> so, he dies, he dies. OK, I said it. <laughs> Well, I didn't know if uh, PG had anything else to say, but I do have a question for Mike. If not, should I ask? Um, <clears throat> so Mike, when you were talking, one thing you said was um, that the solidarity economy is socialism in practice. Um, and so I wanted to talk about that a little bit because um, I wanted to talk about how you actually see that. Like I was just looking up the actual definition of socialism. And one of the definitions is that the, 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 um, the means of production is owned by, it's owned collectively by a centralized government that plans and controls the economy. And so that part I'm not so personally, I'm not so thrilled about. I'm thrilled about people owning it themselves, owning things themselves collectively, like and and making decisions about the things that affect their lives. They anything that affects their lives, they get to decide. Like I'll give you an example. Um, I'm Canadian, and so I'm fam very familiar with the Canadian healthcare system. Um, and there's problems with it. I don't know whether those problems just come from the fact that it's trying to operate in kind of a not quite socialism, not quite, not quite socialism, whether, whether if it was just fully socialism, it would be better. But I think that the, a lot of it comes from the problems come from things being controlled by a government, the centralized government. Um, or like a specific example is my father is on a board of a nursing home in his village and he's he's a retired physician and the provincial government is trying to take it 
take the decision making away from the local people to run it because I think it might be the only nursing home in the province of New Brunswick that's run by the local people. Um, and I think pers like I think that's better than that being that decisions are made for all of the nursing homes in the province by a centralized government. So, so my, I guess my question is like, when we're talking to people about the solidarity economy, I mean, I was in that solidarity economy 101 workshop and in one of the breakout rooms, there was a gentleman who, this was his first, this was his first um, contact with solidarity economy. And so he was like, well, what is this? Is this, uh, they want to have social, they want socialism, they want, you know, and there's a lot of things about socialism, obviously, that turn, turn people off. But if they really understood what it is that we're talking about, it's just like so obvious that it's what, it, it's what we all, we would all benefit from it. Um, but as only as long as we all get to have a say in things that affect our lives. And I think when I think about socialism, a lot of the times I think about my say is being taken away by some centralized government. So I don't know if my question is clear, but but would you qualify that statement? Like when you said that the solidarity economy is socialism in practice, what, what would you say about that? Um, so there are a couple of different strands. So one, I would say that that phrase was thrown out in a DSA meeting um, where there were a lot of folks who were like, hey, you know, we dig socialism. And so it was like, hey, the solidarity economy is socialism in practice. If it, I, I, I don't want to necessarily call it a pitch, but it was a pitch. I mean, it was a pitch to the audience that I was talking to. Um, I, I have a sort of maybe um, a, 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 a personal desire to kind of get rid of the socialist boogeyman. So I, I, I sometimes just throw socialism in the room, just you know, so that folks can like stop being afraid of the word. Because the truth is that you know there are there's a full century of advertising, you know, by uh, U.S. government to kind of create frame a socialist boogeyman that you know causes people to be afraid of the term. Um, and 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 you know, and I mean, I I am also not one of the folks who who sits around with the Marxists and the communists, kind of argue, arguing the point of which socialism is the right socialism um, and which one is not. But I would say that, um, and you know, this is something that I have tried to, um, you know, get to, you know, because I, I have been asked the question before in other spaces, like, how do you sell solidarity economy in a red state? And the first thing I said, and the thing that I said, because I didn't have any other resources to, to drive them towards was like, that's not my ministry, that's not my organizing, and I don't know how to tell you that. But what I can say now, because I have a few more things that I've kind of dug into as other resources, um, I think that there are lots of, you know, uh, red state organizers for progressive causes who have a thing to say about that. Um, George Gale and the People's Lobby, um, you know, um, Wade Rothke and, you know, and the sort of previous iteration of ACORN, you know. So there, there are ways to kind of talk about the cause that root people in um, what is meaningful and important to them. And hopefully if you have, other, if they have other values that are conflicting with the solidarity economy, uh, hopefully, you know, if they have had, you know, uh, views of race or they have views of, of gender, you know, or anything that, that are sort of challenging to the framework of solidarity economy, those are things that people are that that organizers who are are working towards the solidarity economy are wrestling with them on. Like that's principled struggle that you should be in there locally. Um, but I, I, if if the folks that you're organizing around don't like the term socialism, I, you don't have to use the term socialism. Um, but if they are concerned, you know, about the fact that that they they can they can democratically control their workplace, that they can democratically control public budgets. Um, that they can democratically control the ways that land is utilized in their community. If it's important that, you know, um, if a coal company comes in and they're like, you know, we want to mine and somebody has to come to the council and say, is this a, a, a thing that we should be doing? And maybe, you know, because it, that's an issue that could like affect multiple counties that, you know, the, all the other counties have to come together and say, hey, you know, I mean, do we want this mine in the center of like all of these seven counties? Then, hey, you know, that, that for me, 
that's the important thing. The important thing is that we get to the values and the, the values of the solidarity economy, you know, that we talked about in that one on one uh, solidarity, cooperation, mutualism, um, participatory democracy, sustainability, pluralism. Uh, you know, those those are equity, equity, don't forget equity. Um, all of those things are the things that we are trying to get after. And if someone's, you know, concerned with the term socialism, you, got, you don't have to use it. But, you know, ultimately, do those values show up and do the do do those practices um, live in the in the place that we, that we are collectively envisioning. So just to be clear, like socialism and solidarity economy, they're two different terms, right? Would you say? They I would have two say different that socialism that socialism has a lot of nuance. And it's hard to kind of, kind of. So the term, the, the definition you read, it, there's a lot of people who would disagree with the the framing of that definition. And and particularly, like I, I took the Economics for Emancipation with the Center for Popular Economics, and in there they talk about the sort of flavors of socialism, where they talk about you know um, centralized planning or centralized state planning is one flavor of socialism. Um, you might have another one that's like market socialism. You might have another um, that is, and market socialism would be like the Swedish model, you know, Sweden, Sweden, even you know, forms of Canada. It's market socialism, right? You socialize a few things, and you let the capitalism take over some other things. Um, but you know, they they talk about a model, and when they kind of get to their final flavor, they do democratic planning. So democratic planning might look like um, everybody that's involved in the process of an economy. Has a, has a vote on certain aspects of that economy. So when you talk about you know, how production gets done, it's not that a central planning authority tells you you have to produce 100 bicycles and bicycles is their example. It's that the community has a vote around, you know, hey, like what's the actual need for bicycles in this community? How many do we actually need? Okay, well, you know, that's how many we need. So then, you know, they let the bicycle factory know and then the bicycle factory know can, can, can communicate with the steel factory or the rubber factory. You know, so ultimately there's democratic discussion are happening along multiple parts of the sort of economic transaction. And that's sort of way, way down the scale immediately, like, you know, um, yeah. Uh, so so, so that, that's, that's what I would say. Socialism is a very nuanced term and it's hard to kind of just unpack it in, a, in this conversation. Right, okay, thank you. I think we're shrinking down no, our numbers. Um, How many do we have left? I think we're like a five, five. or four or five of us. Um, people are on to other things. Um, like I had one question because it, it's something that's similar that's happened in Virginia just not long ago. Um, so we have a history of electrical co-ops and the kind of agricultural co-ops. Um, um, we, and then we've got a smattering of, of food co-ops in Virginia. Um, not very many, but a few, um, uh, what else? I mean, it's, it goes to this different kind of, there's different types of co-ops uh, kind of conversation. Um, but then last year, uh, the state legislature passed a law that, that created worker co-ops. And a bunch of us were very excited about that. We're like, oh, we've got actually like state, like state law has said there, like you can, you can, well, they, they say you can, you can have, have a worker co-op, but then you dig into the law and it's really just an, an ESOP, like an, an, an uh, employee stock option um, process. Um, so it's, it's, it's realizing it's one type of, so I was curious to hear a little bit more about the process that took place in, in Illinois um, around that legislation and how different or similar it is to what we've got. Yeah, um, so I mean that might go to the the bot the organizing body that was around lobbying for that legislation. The very unique condition that we had in Illinois was that um, the original organizing body that began lobbying for the legislation consisted of um, of worker centers of of you know folks who were were immigrants coming together in worker centers. They they generally you know. Um, advocate for, you know, um, for, for, for fair wages and for, you know, um, for, you know, against wage theft, like, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're folks who are, are, are advocates for their community. Um, so they combined with, um, we had the John Marshall Law School at the time, um, now the Solidarity Economy and Community Enterprise Clinic, 
Um, they were supporting those worker centers in thinking through and in, in helping to form cooperatives. So before the legislation was in place, um, and Renee Hatcher likes to talk about like the law is 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 not in getting in the way of cooperatives. It's it like if you need to kind of work past the law to get a cooperative formed, we can help you. So that's what you know John Marshall did. They were helping them form cooperatives before legislation was in place. Now, when they when there was an opportunity to advocate for the legislation between the change of administrations here, um, those worker centers came together with the law school, uh, which came together with other existing worker cooperatives that were already in the state, uh, which came together, you know, with other entities who who want to kind of you know do things like raise the minimum wage, and they they all began to have those organizing conversations to talk about what should be in this legislation. So this was really a movement driven led piece of legislation and it involved people who had already had relationships with the Sustainable Economies Law Center, which meant that when the legislation was written here, the cooperative values were actually written into the legislation, which is a really key part of it. Um, and so if, if, the, if it was just like, I mean, you know, they have ESOP associations in every state, if it was one of the ESOP associations that was like, hey, you know, we need to have something that has worker crop on it here, then, you know, that's probably how that type of legislation shifted forward. But there's always an opportunity to amend it. So, Yeah, I think that was like this moment where we were like, oh, there's the, there's an opportunity here. Like there's a conversation that got, and I think it was driven by uh, like our loan, um, Lee Carter, who's like our loan uh, representative that has a DSA connection. I think he pushed it forward. And I, but I'd, I'd be curious to say, I don't know if there's a deeper movement behind that. Um, Cause I would, I would, I would think there would be. Um, um, but our, like our, this is one thing we've been thinking about as a group is like our solidarity economy culture and our, like our ecology of, of solidarity economy is still like very, very new. Or, I mean, there's things that have been going on for a long time. I mean, you read Jessica's book and it, she talks a lot about various things like the Knights of Labor and, and um, some mutual aid work that was happening. Um, um, but yeah, I think we're, we're kind of thinking of like, we're trying to, where, where are those things happening and what's going on and, and the think, you know, thoughts of like, how do we actually start to build some kind of ecology around that longer term, so. So maybe another question, anybody? Jennifer, do you wanna try again or? You... Well, I just wanna make sure nobody else wanted to ask a question. I don't wanna take all the time, but I was really curious again about the food hub. I thought that was really cool. And I wanted to understand like, where did the food come from for the food hub? Yeah, um, so the so for that, I'll talk about the the really the two, you know, the folks who led that effort, you know, who, who originally came to the parent council. This was the uh, doc, uh, Baba Fred Carter and Dr. Jafunza Wright Carter. Um, they, you know, operate a space called Black Oak Center for Sustainable Renewable Living, which, as I mentioned, is in Pembroke Township. Um, Pembroke is a historically Black farming community on the borders of or on the edge of Kankakee, um, which is also a very large farming, you know, space here in, in the Illinois. Um, and so effectively, um, Dr. Dr. Wright had been using food as medicine in her health practice for, you know, decades. Um, and so he had already had a buying club that was established inside of the, the, um, the, her health practice. And, that, and because they have uh, Black Oaks in Pembroke Township, they have relationships with the Pembroke Family Farming Association. So some of the food was sourced directly from these farmers in Pembroke. Um, you know, really, and, and what we saw ourselves as doing is like connecting to ends of a pipeline. You have urban communities that don't have access to fresh produce because stores won't house in their community in, in really meaningful, deep ways. And then you have folks in, in, in Pembroke who are really small farm holders who, you know, the only thing that's available to them in, in Chicago is like, hey, come to this farmer's market, which, you know, I mean, you could lose half your produce trucking up here, you know, for, for half a day. Um, so to build a, a pipeline where you have consumers who have a consistent demand and who also can communicate back their needs. Like if once we actually had the, the consumer pipeline established, we could tell farmers like, hey, you know, we're selling out on mustard greens like every single week. We really need you to wrap up production on that. Um, so, so this is really an opportunity to connect small farm holders with consumers who have, who have dollars, but maybe don't have as much dollars as Albertsons or Kroger's appreciate. 
Um, and so, yeah, there was some farm, some food that was coming from Pembroke, but we also, you know, recognized that we were in communities, well, well we were, we weren't going to have all of the needs for the community at all times, and we wanted to be a one-stop shop. So we also used aggregators, you know, things like Murano's, which is a really big, you know, um, warehouse here, um, and other, other sort of aggregation spaces to get produce that wasn't, that's either not in season or that wasn't available in, in uh, Pembroke. Is it still going strong, your food buying uh, network? Is it still going? Um, it, it's not, it's going, and, but it's not the same model as we were, we started there. Um, you know, the, again, that, that, that became very intensive because we couldn't keep the location stable. Um, so now it, it, it shifted to begin operating as an adjunct to the Cook County Health System. So that it had a, a, a good run at that. And now it's operating um, a food trolley that kind of moves between neighborhoods because nobody can open, have just an open air space to you know, do the buying in. So they, they have a food trolley that they move around neighborhoods, but yeah, it is going in some way, absolutely. That's wonderful. Yeah, and Matthew you know, put the link in there for the local food hub in Charlottesville. That was actually the model that we used when we developed it, like we were inspired by Charlottesville. Oh, huh, okay. On the topic of, of opportunities, uh, there, one of the things that drew me, drew me to this is, is more democratic forms of governance and, and latent community structures in the spirit of Jessica Emhart's book, uh, For the Hopeful Day When We Are No Longer Marginalized uh, and We No Longer Have to Make Do. Uh, but uh, along those lines, a, a, a big thing that would be a major breakthrough in that regard, I think, is a federally funded, locally administered job guarantee, which opens the door to people to whom the doors have been closed. We now have a resolution for that that was put forward by Presley and Warnock. Uh, coming on the heels of this will be legislation and people that I'm involved with are, are, are actively writing that legislation right now. And I'm wondering if you see any of the structures that you're working with uh, potentially being able to benefit from something like this, potentially being able to, sh to shape something like this. Are there things, needs that you imagine when you hear that, that you could, blanks that you could fill in? Um, so, I don't know. <laughs> That's going to give the, the 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 big answer, the big beautiful. I don't know. Um, you know, there there are some ways that I like. You know, I've listened to the the arguments for the federal job guarantee. Um, I've I've read the you know the the freedom document. You know, authored that way back in the sort of Freedom Bill of Rights. Um, you know, in the Civil Rights era, and so you know, um, I, I I do think it's beneficial. I don't necessarily know yet how my sort of organizing aligns with it, except to say that, hey, you know, um, I support the folks who are, who are pursuing it and I would love to see sort of how it evolves. Um, but, you know, um, I, I don't necessarily know its application yet, especially, and, you know, usually I, I, I try to help, to help folks situate that like, you know, I organize in an, in an urban context and there are specific things about the urban geography that are very different. You know, one of the things I talked about, you know, with a friend recently was the, about this notion of intentional community. Um, I live in Southeast Chicago. I don't intend to move from here anytime soon. So how can I build intentional community in spaces that are not necessarily intentionally designed? Um, and so, yeah, you know, that that's that's sort of the, the long winding answer in saying that like, I see alignment and I see how it fits within the solidarity economy. I don't know if there's any way that I am personally connected to it or, you know, am, am moving forward on it at the moment. Cool. Well, I think time is coming to an end um, and I know I have to jet off to something <laughs> else like everybody. Um, so Mike, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us and um, she can share all that's happening. I know we've got a lot to learn. Um, is the is the I was just curious. Is the the radio hour, the drama hour, is it happening? Is that, you said it's on it's on Facebook or like where can we get access to that and like listen in? Yeah, it's um it happens the second Monday of every month um, on the Colonet Collaborative Facebook page. Um, 
So yeah, so I um, the, if you go to the Colonut Collaborative uh, Colonut Collab page uh, website, um, there are some uh, research you know spaces where you can kind of see the old episodes. Um, but you can also just kind of access on the Colonut Collaborative Facebook page. All of the old episodes are archived there. Um, you know, I post them later to the YouTube site and Internet Archive. But um, yeah, that's how you can access them. Great. I know I've been listening to a few of them and I really love them. So, um, um, well, thank you so much. Um, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Um, and uh, uh, we'll hopefully we'll be in touch over time. Hopefully you'll see us pop up in other USN efforts or whatnot. Um, but again, thank you so, so much. Absolutely. You're thank welcome. you, Mike. All right. Thank you all. Cool. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Bye.